Hello everybody, today this, the Porsche Cayman GT4 RS, easily one of the most anticipated sports cars of the current decade and one that is so special many, including myself, were convinced that Porsche would never actually make it. But they have and it's here. However, there is one tiny problem. You see, this car has arrived with lofty expectations on account of it being the latest product from Porsche's GT department, led by Andreas Preuninger, the man with the Midas touch. And of late, they've been branching out a little bit. In fact, I've only just handed back a KN Turbo GT, a 4x4 built by the GT department. And though that should have been a very silly idea all round, and in many ways is, it was also brilliant. So if they can make a two and a quarter ton SUV fun to drive, then crafting something brilliant from a Cayman should be something they can do in their sleep. But there is a problem. You see, though historically I've always had a fondness for the Cayman, the 718 generation has, on the whole, left me fairly cold. But with this car, it certainly has all the ingredients for true greatness, so there really is nowhere to hide. And if anyone can get this right, it's the GT department. And I really hope that they have, because this truly is the last chance saloon for the Cayman, which in not too long is going to be replaced with an all electric variant, meaning that this is to be the first, the last, and the only petrol powered Cayman GT4 RS. There is no time for a second chance, and therefore this is a car I can afford to give no quarter. Today, I shall be judge, JM, and executioner. Did you hear that car? I am the law. Before I take this car out and render judgment, I need to explain to you why it's not just a very special car, but also genuinely unique. And to do that, I need to tell you a story. One that will be a little bit abridged because it covers quite a time span and likely in a few places inaccurate, but hopefully you'll get the gist. It's called One Man and the many interesting places you can insert a hammer. A long time ago, there was a primordial ooze, and eventually something crawled out of it. A few years later, a group of men, presumably who smoked a lot and with facial hair, got together and invented the 911. They saw it and they said that it was good. And they would, wouldn't they? Because they'd invented it and they were men. Now, I cannot say exactly what it was that they had been smoking, but evidently one of them at least had thought it was a good idea to put the engine in the back of their sports car. Presumably nobody saw fault with this because their last car, the 356, also had the engine in the back. And that presumably was because the car before that they had a hand in also had the engine in the back. That being the Beetle. You may have heard of it. However, that was a car designed to be economical. And the reason the engine went in the back was because at the time it was an economical and clever way to do things. But in a sports car, not so much. The net result was that the early 911 in particular had some unusual and undesirable handling characteristics, a reputation which haunts it to this very day. Now, most ordinary people, and I would wager most women, would look at that and go, hmm, we've made a mistake here, let's move that engine forward into the middle where it probably should be, something that, by the late 1960s, other manufacturers were already doing. But no, these men with their funny facial hair and presumably even funnier cigarettes decided that, uh, nine, das ist gut as it is, there must be something else wrong with the car, not basic physics. So, for the next 60 years and counting, they continued to try and engineer around this fairly fundamental flaw that none of them could see, to the point that today a 911 is actually a fabulous handling thing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Not long after the introduction of the 911, Porsche realised they needed a new entry-level model to replace the 356, which was in of itself getting quite old. They brought out the 914, and it had, amazing to believe I know, an engine in the middle. But Porsche, you see, are not very good parents. They have a favourite, 
and its name is 911. So, at all points during the 914's life, they made sure it could never quite nip at the 911's heels in too significant a way. To take over from the 914, they had the 924, which conveniently they had actually been developing for VW as an affordable entry-level sports car. But VW decided they didn't want it. Porsche then bought the rights to the car they had already been developing and started building that. More interestingly, alongside this, they also introduced another car, also with the engine in the front. This was the 928, but unlike the 924, it was designed to sit above the 911 in the model range, having two more cylinders, a V8, more leather, more features, more luxury, more tech, and was, some theorised, designed to replace the 911 entirely. Unfortunately, come the 1980s, and it seems like Stockholm Syndrome had truly set in, because regardless of the fact Porsche offered, in some ways, a better car for both less and more money than the 911, people kept buying the 911. They even started buying 911 turbos, which had gained a reputation for being even scarier than their forebears, yet still sold. Porsche then realised this was a bit of a problem. They'd created a monster, and one that they weren't going to be able to get rid of. They even commissioned a study to see just how far they could take the 911 platform. It was called the 959, and the answer was quite a way, actually. So, come the mid-1990s, and the two cars that were axed were the 924 successor, the 968, and the 928, leaving, once again, the 911 as the only car in the Porsche lineup. But by this stage, it and its air-cooled engine were looking a little bit old and creaky, despite a couple of facelifts. So, in the late 1990s, the Porsche lineup was rejuvenated, and we saw the introduction of not just a new water-cooled 911, the 996, but also the radical new Boxster. Taking on from the 968, this was in many ways a spiritual successor to the 914, because although it shared nearly all of its components with the 911 from the doors forward, the engine at the back was architecturally similar to the 911, but not in the rear, it was in the middle. And the moment this car was announced, a lot of people looked at it and went, hmm, that's a car that's probably going to be dynamically quite a bit better to drive than the 911. And sure enough, the Boxster found many fans, though not amongst 911 owners who were very upset that their expensive Porsche kept getting mistaken for the much cheaper one, on account of the fact that at the front, it was the same. So, to try and quell this potential uprising throughout the entirety of its life, the Boxster, fabulous though it was, was never allowed to get too close to the specification and performance of its bigger brother, the 911. And where that car got many special edition versions, the Turbo, the GT3, GT3 RS, the Boxster stayed as simply Boxster and Boxster S. No special editions for you. And this, people thought, was how it was going to be forever, because that was how it always had been. Then, come the end of that car's production run, and its replacement was due, the 987. But along with this came a rumour that Porsche were going to be making a coupe version of the Boxster. And this, once again, set people thinking, going, hmm, well, now with a roof on the car, it will be even stiffer, therefore even better dynamically again, and this really will be a car that should be faster and more exciting than the old 911. But when that car did arrive, called now the Cayman, once again it looked like Porsche had just snipped its wings a little bit to make sure it didn't pester Big Brother. The Cayman was a very curious character because when it launched it cost more than the Boxster, and in Carland having the Coupe cost more than the convertible is all backwards and stuff. So to justify that price increase it had just a little bit more power, but disappointingly Porsche once again made sure it didn't have quite as much power as a regular 911, nor did it have a limited slip differential, or in some cases, even the option of one. And so, everyone who drove it said, this is a fabulous car, brilliant really, dynamically superior to the 911, but just lacking the firepower that it really deserves. And we all stood there and went, oh well, close but no cigar once again from Porsche. Then they said that they were going to do a Cayman R, and we all got a little bit excited because we thought, ah, oh, finally, they might actually be doing it. Is this a Cayman with the power of a 911? Because that'll be something truly special. Then it arrived, and it was a Cayman S with a few extra options, a token amount more power, and a slightly smaller fuel tank to fool everybody into thinking that it was lighter. And so we all stood there going, you know what? 
We should blame ourselves, really. We were silly for thinking that Porsche were ever going to do it. Clearly, the Cayman is never going to be allowed even close to the 911. Time went on, a few other variants came out, but again, nothing ever quite that good. On comes the 981 generation Cayman and Boxster, the new variant. And then we hear a story about something that turned into the Cayman GT4. And this is where things got really exciting because Porsche went further than any of us could have dared dream. Not only were they at long last building a car with proper 911 power, it was also going to be a GT, the baby brother to the GT3. And when it landed, it did so with a fairly significant fanfare. But still, some were disappointed because, though it had the front suspension from a GT3, what it did not have was a real GT engine. Instead, it had a slightly detuned version of that you'd find in a regular Carrera S, which was, of course, a lot more than many Cayman owners have been used to, but still, in the eyes of many, not enough. And once again, people were stood there going, oh, so close and yet so far. Here was proof, material, that the car had oodles of potential and yet you knew you got that feeling that Porsche was still very very wary of the Cayman stepping on the 911's toes to the extent that if you look at the specs for a Cayman GT4 and a regular 911 there's quite a gulf between them even though in the real world we all knew that the two cars were pretty much matched and this was a shame but we thought this was how things were to always be then a big blow with the arrival of the 718 generation of Cayman and Boxster, the next version, because out went the naturally aspirated six cylinders for the whole range and in came a series of four cylinder turbo engines. All us petrol heads breathed out a sigh and went, oh. Once again, by many a petrol head, this was seen solely as an attempt to create a little bit of distance between the entry level Boxster Cayman and the 911, the gold standard. But then we heard there was to be a new GT4, and we all got very excited indeed. The car was eventually announced, and it had a proper, naturally aspirated six-cylinder engine. More than that, one they had created from the ground up based on the three-litre twin-turbo in the 911. That was quite a surprise. They'd gone and built a whole engine just for the GT4. That was pretty cool, but still, not quite enough. The car was more aggressive, more aero, more serious, more hardcore, more stiffer, more lower, more everything, but not a full fat GT. Because we all knew deep down that if they gave that engine to that car, it would show up many a 911. And the fact was that in this time, the 911's engine itself had been slowly moving ever forward to the point that that car was also nearly mid-engined. There is a reason that when you open the boot of a 911 now, you cannot see the engine at all. It's no longer there. It's about here. And then pictures started circulating of something going around the Nürburgring. It clearly was a Cayman with some different aero addenda on it, but nobody was really sure what was going on. I personally thought they were testing a new race car. And then it turned out they were building this. This is a Cayman with the front suspension from a 991 GT3 and the engine from a 911 GT3 technically slightly detuned, making only 500 horsepower on account of the fact it's got a different exhaust to a 911. But otherwise, this is the car that so many people have been waiting for for so long. This is the car that perhaps we're only getting because the Cayman is now on borrowed time and Porsche know it will not be succeeded. This is the car where Andreas Poininger and his team were evidently given a blank sheet, a big checkbook and told, go on, make that car we've all been waiting for. This is the sort of car that you would normally expect to see only in the museum. Yeah, we trialled it as a concept, but uh, the bean counters upstairs said it would never work. The amazing thing being that the list price of this car actually is shockingly reasonable, about £110,000 plus options. And the ingredients list really is spectacular. You've got some serious aero, front to back, swan neck rear spoiler, big wheels, bigger brakes, these lovely vents in the arch here for the Visac pack, a carbon fibre bonnet, carbon fibre wing mirrors, carbon here, carbon here, carbon here, carbon here, and carbon intakes on the side feeding in the centre of this car, a genuine fire breathing, four litre, naturally aspirated, 9,000 RPM, six individual throttle body screamer from the 992 GT3. All it's missing over the 992 is the double wishbone front suspension, but this still has the last generation GT3 suspension in any case, 
And it really is truly a spectacular thing. Many, many people thought this just would not ever happen. The sheer concept of it alone is really quite exciting. But what about the execution? admit that ahead of collecting this car I was suffering from a greater than usual level of nerves and I'm not just talking about the value of it and the fact I think this is the only one that Porsche GB have so if I did bend it there'd be a line of very very angry journalists behind me but instead it's because I genuinely want this to be a brilliant car and the simple fact is the last 718 that I spent any meaningful time in was the GTS 4.0 and that was a car that everybody else seemed to love but I found really quite badly missed the mark and I was so concerned that this would be the same. Is it? I'll put you out of your misery now. No, this is a fabulous car, though it's not an unqualified success. And my first few hours in this car weren't the most enjoyable, not simply because the first roads I really experienced were the M4, the M25 and then the M11. Not exactly the natural territory for this, but instead the fact that I am, um, well, I nearly binned it, and I mean that quite literally, I nearly drove it into some bins. You see, when I exited Porsche Reading, as I've done many times, I fancied a McDonald's. It was very early in the morning and uh, I was hungry, and I thought I had turned into McDonald's, but instead where I'd actually gone was the uh, delivery access route for a large warehouse. Having realised my mistake, I thought, right, best turn around quickly before I get told off. I went to turn, and the car didn't. It just kept going straight on, so I applied the brakes, and then it didn't want to stop. I quickly realised why. That is because this car is currently wearing a set of Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s, which are exactly the kind of tyre you'd expect it to have on, but not the kind of tyre that you want when it's just gone 8 o'clock in the morning in the sort of late middle of February and it's uh, only a few degrees outside. It was a hair-raising moment, I will confess, and maybe because of that I didn't notice the fact the car was also in its sport mode for the suspension. This, unlike many 911s, the KN and all that stuff, doesn't have drive modes, instead it's just got settings for the things that you can alter, which I think actually works better. So you've got a button for the PDK gearbox to put it into sport, a button for the suspension to do the same, you've got a button for the exhaust, you've also got one for front lift because this car has that, and you've also got a couple for the traction control that I will be staying well away from. The suspension was the first thing that I noticed because in sport mode this car is unrelentingly firm. It is absolutely unbearable. I recall reading that Andreas Preuninger said with this car it's about nine seconds slower around the ring than a GT3, which on paper is a similar thing. And part of the reason for that was that he wanted to make this a more road orientated car, something more comfortable, something more livable. If this is his idea of comfy and road biased, I'm not sure I want to experience the new and incoming GT3 RS, which genuinely looks like it escaped at the end of the Molzan Strait. Even with that mode deactivated, it's still a fairly firm thing, particularly at low speeds, but then so is an Alpine A110, and that rides fantastically. Once you do get even 20 or 30 mile an hour behind you, it does loosen up just a little bit, but at all times reminds you, you are in something that always has one eye on the track. As you might expect, and I'm sure you've read, this car isn't a natural motorway cruiser. I had thought that might be on account of the fact the engine now lives in the cabin with you, but actually that's not the issue, provided you keep the exhaust button off, otherwise it's just needlessly boomy, the biggest problem is road noise. It's bad. On anything other than a glassy smooth surface, it's really very loud in here, annoyingly so. But you see, that I knew. What was more of a concern was how good it was actually going to be when you get to this bit. So let's talk about that.
I think the real reason that I was quite so upset with the 992 GT3 when I drove it was I felt that was the moment where the GT3 crossed the line from being a mostly road car with a bit of track focus to a mostly track car with a bit of road focus. It was at all times just unexciting unless you were absolutely giving it the big one and even when you were just didn't seem to reward whereas the older generation of car I'm not even talking about the old air-cooled stuff I mean 991.2 was exciting at all moments even at road legal speeds so where does this sit well somewhere in between the two to truly understand how I feel about this car, let's break it down into its component parts. And we may as well begin with that engine, because that's the thing everybody's talking about. Of course, here it is essentially the same unit as in the 992 GT3, and so has all of that car's strengths and weaknesses. Everybody tends to focus on the 9,000 RPM redline, and when you get it there, it's quite an amazing thing. The last 500 RPM in particular feels like the exhaust just falls off and the whole cabin resonates. It's quite sensational and a shame you can only really do it in two gears before somebody comes and drags you off to prison. But what so few people are willing to discuss is the fact that below 5,000 RPM and certainly below 3,000 RPM this doesn't really have all that much to offer. It's been a little while since I drove a 901.2, but I didn't remember that engine feeling the same way. This does. When I did the 992 review, a lot of people complained and said that I was wrong, but um, in this particular car, and I think 992 as well, there is actually a graph here showing you where the power and the torque in this engine is, and even that agrees with me. It's at five where the thing really starts to become a little bit more interesting, and when it does get to five, cool. You know about it, it does not hang about. And this I beg you to put in the category of observation, not criticism. It's something I've noticed, not something that I dislike, because frankly, if you're buying into this sort of car, you have signed up for that 9,000 RPM redline, haven't you? That's what you're here for. What is, I think, though, a little bit more controversial is the gearbox that said engine is attached to. Here in the GT4 RS, you have exclusively a seven-speed PDK which, to be fair, I can't count against the car because if you were to buy a GT3 RS, it would be the same. And in many ways, the gearbox pairs perfectly with the Rev Happy engine. mentioned it does have the two modes regular and sport frankly there seems to be very little difference between them but I confess to being a little bit disappointed with it because in auto mode it's fine when you're at low speed low throttle it does a fairly good impression of a regular automatic Porsche's PDK has always been one of the best for that but when you go to then make an overtake, you put your foot down even a little bit and it won't change down one or two gears, it'll change down about four, which if you were in sport mode, I could forgive. But it's done that when I haven't been and it's um, not just terrifying, because that I think is maybe a little bit harsh and unfair, but it's a bit obnoxious. It does attract a lot more attention than it needs to and um, it's just not necessary. Trying to go past somebody who's just minding their own business when you're doing 7,000 RPM, no, no, no. The other thing for me, and I think what bugs me a lot more, is the fact that it lacks drama. The 991.1 GT3 had a PDK gearbox which was revolutionary because that was the first time it had felt exciting. The gearbox was an event, and this meant a lot because in that car, if you recall, was the first time that a GT3 had not been offered with a manual. This to me really does feel like quite a step back. Technically, it's absolutely amazing, particularly in sport mode. It will give you incredible downshifts. Here, I'm gonna go from sixth to second. That's decent, I like that, but it's on the upshifts where it's still very, very quick. Obviously can't show you in town, but just doesn't have that crack, that pop, that little moment to make you go, Whoa, oh, that was fun, I love that. And that to me really does take away a big part of the experience. As I'm now driving through town and it would seem inappropriate to talk about anything else dynamic, let's talk about something else I also found a little bit lacklustre. 
the interior, just like the KN Turbo GT. I don't know what it is with Porsche, or perhaps more accurately Porsche customers, but this car is offered in a wide range of fairly nice colours, including this lovely yellow, and on the outside it's this fabulous, wacky thing that quite suits my sensibilities. However, open the door, and once again for a Porsche product, you're greeted with a festival of noir. This is so depressing in here, and the thing is, I can't even blame this on Porsche because I've been through the configurator. You can have some really nice stuff in here, but let's be honest with ourselves, shall we? This is how they're all gonna come, isn't it? Black leather, black Alcantara, maybe not even with the leather, and it just, uh, and look, that's, that's not how leather is supposed to feel, Porsche. That's not how it's supposed to be. This doesn't feel a special thing inside. You've got a tiny glimpse of those little vents on the arches over there, and that's nice, but it's just not enough. It just isn't. The seats, though, I will give special mention to. These are brilliant. The only thing I would have, and that's convenient because I don't think you can really have all that much else in here. I love them. They support you. They're actually pretty comfortable for longer journeys. I did three hours this morning, having just done three hours to drop the Turbo GT off, and I love them. They're fabulous. Same goes for the brakes, actually, though I haven't really had any opportunity to lean on them. The fact is, on the road, I'm unlikely to, but these monstrous and annoyingly optional carbon ceramic stoppers do, um, well, they do the job. And, as I've mentioned the O word now, I suppose this is as good a time as any to talk you through some of the options available to you on this car. But for that, I'm going to hand you over to the slightly calmer and less frustrated voiceover JM. The base price of the Cayman GT4 RS I'm driving today is £108,370. The specification of this press car is very close to what I think most owners will be going for. As with any Porsche, there are a number of things that really should be standard. The Chrono Pack at £194, tyre sealant and compressor £42, dimming mirrors with rain sensor at £345, cruise control at £228, park assist on the rear with reversing camera £825 and my personal favourite, a first aid kit, nine quid. The big news for the RS is the Visac package. First seen on the 918, this is becoming more common on the firm's raciest models, and likely designed to appeal to the hardcore enthusiast. Because of this, I expect it is also going to appeal to the collector crowd, so is going to be a must-have option for many. It consists of the carbon bonnet, carbon intakes with considerably more pronounced scoops, carbon for the rear wing, a poor script on the rear window, and titanium tailpipe finishers. Inside, there is the titanium cage, carbon for the intake and airbox cover, and Visac pack-specific trim pieces. This option also enables you to specify the forged magnesium wheels. The Visac pack with the roll cage is £12,305, or 9804 without, though the Porsche website and my spec sheet seem to disagree on the exact pricing. And if you do want those magnesium wheels, they're another eleven and a half grand. What upsets me most about this pack is that it features all of that carbon, but if you want the small triangles by the mirrors to be in it as well, that's another near 400 quid. More items off the options list fitted to this car include the front lift, essential and £1835, and the rock hard leather interior pack, which might not feel great, but does look better than standard, and that's 1242 Without it, you'll see a lot more race techs, particularly with the Visac pack equipped. My favourite item, though, has to be those bucket seats. You can fit standard multi-way adjustable ones in the car if you want to never be able to sell it. However, what's notable about this specific example is it has the 3D printed body form foam. £1,895, but I tell you, it works. They felt great. The other big option on this car was the ceramics. Given it was obvious these were all going to be highly specced, track-focused cars from the off, I really don't know why Porsche continue to have them as an option. But they are, and a £6,000 one at that. All of this brings the total of the car to £1,333,549. Excellent value, and utterly and completely irrelevant, as we'll later discuss. Now, back to the action. Thank you for that voiceover, JM. Now, we're back on the road again. What else do I notice? Well, visibility four is pretty good. Directly aft, other than the fact that the uh, wing and the scaffolding get in the way, 
it's okay, okay as it ever will be in a sports car. Over your outside shoulder is not so bad, but the inside one is pretty sketchy. Because you've got all this lovely carbon intake, you can see essentially nothing over there. Now thus far, it hasn't proven to be an issue, but I am constantly concerned that I do have a very, very big blind spot for what is a fairly small car. And now I'm gonna to talk to you about the one thing I was worried would ruin this car. But first, a musical interlude. It's loud in here, isn't it? Right, steering. This is what I was so worried about. The 992s was good, but not great. And in the last 718 I drove, it was a deal breaker. At low speeds, it was full of promise and a little bit of waiting, and I thought that maybe it would work. After all, electric power steering, as this car has, is another thing that the GT department seemed to perfect. The first 991-911 just wasn't that good, but the GT3, really sorted it and though it never achieved the giddy heights of the old hydraulic steering it was certainly more than good enough here the first few hours i just thought oh no oh no the steering it's just not right it's so inert no communication but that was because i was on the motorway with freezing cold cup twos then i got onto more interesting roads the tires began to warm i built a little bit of confidence and at that moment where in the GTS, the steering should step up to the plate, but instead goes on holiday, this steps up. Like the 992, it is not brilliant, but to criticize this really feels like telling somebody that they didn't do so well at the Olympic Games. They still got to the Olympics, that's still a fair achievement. And this, though lacking that feedback you get in some older cars, is still pretty darn good. The weighting is just about spot on. You get a little bit of texture, and most importantly, you do get a feeling of what's going on at the front of this car. I do feel like in current conditions, the tires really are holding me back, though I will say, much like the 992, this thing is devastatingly quick. Were I out here in my 430 Scuderia, which on paper is a similar thing, stripped out, hardcore, road racer, similar weight, similar power, the Ferrari wouldn't see which way the Porsche went. This is mad, this thing. And that may actually be, odd as it sounds, a criticism, because this car really does egg it on to go quite quickly. You chase that 9,000 RPM red line, then realize you're barreling into a corner at um, a quite unthinkable speed, certainly an unspeakable one. All right, not that you care. What's the turning circle like? It's, uh, it's not bad, actually. So here's where this rear three-quarter visibility can be a pain, but I have got a reversing camera. that this car had just a bit more mid-range. Peak torque is about 320, 330 pound foot, 450 newton meters, but it comes in quite late. According to the little graph down here for torque, I get most of it at about 3,000 RPM, but more tellingly, like the power, there is a big swell in it between five and six, and that really is where this engine wants to be. It's just a shame that uh, if you've got any kind of social conscience, that's not somewhere you can be all that often or for all that long. I will also say that here, the suspension does seem to cope with the road just that little bit better. Mr. Breuninger was evidently true to his word. It is through little sections like that, and this one coming up, you get to experience this car's finest dynamic quality. 
it has some of the most delicious weight transfer I have experienced in anything modern. It really is an extremely competent chassis this because that's not something I ever really tend to pay much attention to but here the car just highlights quite how good it is. It's a bit like the class boffin showing you his latest project and you're annoyed that he's showing off but he is also quite good at it. So I think that covers just about all the important stuff. Engine, gearbox, brakes, tyres, handling, and in all of those areas, the Cayman GT4 RS does very, very well. But how does it come together? Well, that's trickier because it is a very, 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 very good car. It is better than a 992 GT3. I would happily have one of these over one of those, but just about everybody else appears to think the same way. And because this is yet another car with a GT badge on it, that meant it stood absolutely no chance whatsoever of going to the people that really should have it. Already, there are a whole bunch of these up on Auto Trader for grossly inflated sums, with people asking a quarter of a million pounds in some cases, and POA for others, which is trade for you really, really don't want to know, and you almost certainly wouldn't believe it. And this is where life becomes very difficult for me because this is the bit where I have to put my sensible hat on. This is a lovely fine car to do all this kind of fun stuff in. But this is also a car that falls into a very, very difficult place because on the one hand, it is a pretty darn good road car. But if I were doing this route in a Lotus Emira, I'd be having just as much fun, sure, not going as fast, but having more fun at lower speed, which in my mind is a victory. It's also more special, to my eyes anyway, it's more bespoke looking car, and I expect for the vast majority of people, even at its list price of 110-ish thousand pounds, or realistically 130 to 150, it's a bit too expensive as a track toy. However, you already know that you can't get one of these for list price. If you haven't already got one, or you aren't about to get one, you're not going to get it at list price. So do I compare this with other stuff at list price, which you can go and buy, where it has realistically nearly no competitors? Or do I compare this with the other sort of stuff you could get for the money you're actually going to have to pay to get your hands on one of these? And let's be generous, let's call it a 200 thousand pound car, not a quarter of a million. Well, if you want to do the day-to-day -day thing, if you want to drive this all the time, which you could, I certainly recommend having the lift. I haven't had any issues thus far, but you do want it. That nose does sit quite low. Then an Emira, I would say, is the overall better bet. Certainly more comfortable, even with the sport chassis, though the Cayman, impressively, does retain its twin boot configuration, so is quite practical. A shame then that it's quite so ludicrously noisy inside and actually kind of balmy that it's not the engine producing said noise. Incidentally, if you do get to drive one of these, don't press the exhaust button, because all that changes really is at certain speeds and RPMs, it just becomes droney. Anyway, on the road, Emira, luggage space aside, better. More special, more interesting, much cheaper. You can actually buy one. Yes, Lotus have just put the price up. I'm sure Porsche have put their prices up too, and Lotus are difficult to deal with, I appreciate. But it's a cool thing, very usable, and also quite a desirable car at the moment. But then as a track toy, I suppose you could go and buy a, a Caterham and a nicely specced, barely used Cayman for the same money as this, and you'd have a better road car and a better track car. Let's then consider you don't want to use this daily. Instead, you've got it as a weekend toy, something to take out when the conditions are right, to have a little bit of fun for a few hours in. Well, if you're thinking about dropping £200,000, that opens up a whole world of pretty serious and extraordinary machinery with genuine theater. That money will get you into a Lamborghini Aventador, the definitive supercar of the last 10 years, an incredible V12. And though it has its failings, you cannot argue with the presence and the theater of that. You could also get, for quite a bit less money, a Gallardo Superleggera, which is equally as dramatic, a little bit more usable on our roads, and a very, very fun thing for an hour. 
also very stiffly sprung, more so even than this. But um, if you're into your Lambos, that could be an option. You also, at that money, have access to a whole world of 430 Scuderias, a car that's a little bit closer to home and one that I've had in mind the whole time I've been driving this. And the fact is that the 430 is a little bit more practical than you might expect. I don't think it's any noisier inside, despite the fact you'd expect it, because the 430 doesn't really even have carpets. And it does have a lot more drama and presence. This is a nice looking car, but I had it in the car park today and I wasn't looking at it going, oh God, I need that. The 430 though, does that to me. You'd nearly even get into a Challenge Stradale for the same money if that was your bag. And both of those are great driving cars, the 430 more so, and the 430's trump card for me is the theater of the gearbox. It's hilarious, that thing. Yeah, older tech, slower, worse in any measurable way, but better in all the ones that aren't measurable. And yes, it's a Ferrari, it's older, it will cost quite a bit to run, it will be thirsty. This incidentally has been okay. It's done mid twenties on the motorway and um, I don't know what I, I got there. The fuel tank's a little smaller than it should be, 64 liters. Really for me, it should be at least 70 the way that this drinks. But uh, if that was the compromise to get this car made, then so be it. I was genuinely worried that I'd get into this review and then leave it going, ah, oh, I'm so frustrated I can't have one of these or certainly not a new one anyway. And that's the only way I'd want it because I'd need to spec it to my tastes, Tarts handkerchief, in case you were wondering. But actually, it's a lovely, really, really very nice thing. Five out of five, nine and a half out of 10. But am I excited by it? No. I'm impressed by it, thoroughly impressed by it. It's extremely competent. And it's very fast and it's very wonderful. And if you're into your Porsches, I can see why it gets all the praise that it gets. But am I gonna be ringing Porsche dealers to sell my soul? No. Does that mean this car is a failure? Not a bit of it. I am enormously thankful to Porsche for allowing Andreas Preuninger and the team to create this at all, and I'm thoroughly delighted that at long last, the final generation of the Cayman, the 718, has not just a brilliant car in the stable, but this also is a fitting and wonderful epitaph for the naturally aspirated mid-engine Porsche. It took a bit longer than I would have liked for them to get here, but they did get here, and for that, I'm glad. Big thank you to Porsche GB for lending me this car, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.